and so um so everything that is said during um this uh, event will be recorded so i just wanted to make sure that i give everyone the heads up that i will be doing that first um again thank you all for uh, making it here um i want to introduce kalkalia yang who if you wanted to say a couple words to us before you start the reading um yeah Thank you, Ping. Hello, thank you all for joining tonight. You know, in in a different time, we will be meeting in person, not just anywhere, but at my beloved neighborhood library, Arlington Hills. I'm a child of the East Side. I grew up going to the old Arlington. It's now been relocated, but the spirit of the place lives on. And I think it lives on in the new refugees and immigrants and the, the community that makes use of its resources. So it's really an honor for me to be able to, to share my work via the St. Paul Public Libraries. If you'd asked me before when I was writing the book, The Shared Room, who I was writing it for, I would tell you that I was writing it for the grieving children, for the children who lost other children in their lives. In the world of picture books, there are very few resources for families that are grieving, particularly ones uh, where children are centered. And so that's what I would have said before. But in the world that we are living in now, where there is so much grief all around us, so many tragedies unfolding, in a world where we sometimes only look up doors and walls, we cannot enter into the houses of others, I found that the share room is an incredible resource in teaching young children about compassion, about the less pretty elements of life, about sitting with sorrow, something that um, it isn't very American. We're taught in children's literature to celebrate joy, happiness, the good times. The, but we have a much harder time talking about sadness, about sorrow. And so I hope that the share room will, will make its contribution. I'm particularly excited because this book um, is, is illustrated by a Hmong American illustrator, C. Writer. There are not many Hmong illustrators in the world of children's literature. After my first book, my first children's book, A Map into the World, um, I knew that I wanted to work with Hmong illustrators. I understood that the journey would, for me would be very lonely if I didn't invite my, uh, my community into the, into the field. And so I am so very excited that this book features uh, the work of a fellow Hmong mother, a fellow East Sider, and a wonderful artist. Because there are so few of us in here, I think we can have a really good conversation after the reading. So I'll start paying if you can queue up your screen. And let me know when you're ready and I'll start. The Shared Room by Kyle Kalia Yang, illustrations by C. Writer. For the children who miss and grieve and love those who have gone. For the siblings of Jianna, Lili, Tiku, Duoli, and the new baby Lucia, our sister always and forever. It was a balmy winter day in Minnesota. The sky was heavy with gray clouds. The snow had begun to melt and patches of yellow grass peeked through the dirty white. The ice grew thin over puddles of dark water and cracked like broken glass. In an old house on the east side of St. Paul, a mother and father sat before a dark fireplace with their three children playing close by. They kept the light dim in the house. The shadows from the corners reach out and touch the feet of the children. The light entered the room from a single wide window and a picture on the wall. The window looked out at a red stop sign where neighborhood children waited for the bus in a long line on school days. On the wall, there was a picture of their fourth child another daughter smiling beneath the summer sun, her brown hair glinting with streaks of gold, her eyes soft and shiny 
her mouth open in joy, white teeth in a fine row. Seven months had passed since the girl in the picture had drowned. The day she died had been hot, sweaty. The family had gone to the swimming lake. Bright umbrellas unfolded on the sand like flowers in bloom. Elderly people read their newspapers and books on lounge chairs and towels. Young men and women played volleyball nearby. No one saw the little girl walk into the water, laugh when the water touched her toes with its cool, walk further into the lake, feel the water around her waist, walk until her feet lost touch with the ground, float for a moment, and then struggle to surface. The day she died now existed as a bubble above all the other days on the family's calendar, a fragile and fierce floating thing untethered to the earth, well below the clouds, but beyond anyone's reach. Her room had remained empty, her clothes in their drawers, the picture she had drawn at school still taped on the walls, her bed, her blanket, her sheets, her pillow, still held her scent and the dents she had made in them. Several times a day, the mother or the father opened the door to their daughter's room, went in, sat on the floor beside the bed, leaned their heads into the sheets and the blanket, sniffed deep, closed their eyes, and sometimes hoped never to wake again. But then the three other children called up from the stairs and no matter how tired, the mother or the father would respond, I'm coming. A quiet had entered the house. No matter how, low, how loud the voice became or how, or how hard the younger girl laughed or cried, there seemed a sound barrier over the family. A hush like winter had settled in their home. Sometimes the quiet got too loud and the mother and the father play videos of the girl singing on their phones. Her brothers and sister clambered close to watch the image flickering across their screen. A little girl from happier time, laughing and dancing, singing aloud, let it go, let it go, with her hands raised high above her head, her steps taking her further and further beyond the screen. The oldest boy was 10. He had shared a room with his younger brother for as long as he could remember. He thought that it would stay like this until everyone grew up and moved away. He did the math. The house had three bedrooms. One bedroom was for the mother and the father and the baby sister. One was for the sister who had drowned. And the last one was for himself and his brother. He knew old houses didn't grow new rooms easily. And so he believed that he would always share a room with his younger brother. One warm January day, as he was drawing by himself in the light of the window, his mother said quietly, do you want your sister's room? He looked at his parents sitting on low stools before the dark fireplace. His mother was looking at him closely. He stammered, yes. She said, tonight we'll move you in. He said, where am I going to sleep? His father said, in your sister's bed. He said, where am I going to put my clothes? His father answered, in her drawers. He had been sad, but he hadn't cried in front of his mother and father. He had comforted his younger brother and sister when they cried. He tried to answer their questions as best he could about where their sister was and why she would never return. Now the tightness in his chest was climbing up his throat. And no matter how hard he swallowed, he knew it would erupt. His next words came out in a cry and a question. She's never coming back? His hands covered his eyes and his face, so all he saw was the water of his world spilling over in the dark of his closed palm. That night, the mother and the father and the boy took off the sheets from the sister's bed and put on new sheets. His mother went through her daughter's drawers and folded the clothes into an empty suitcase for her younger girl to wear in a couple of years. 
His father swept the room with a broom, and the girl's hair stuck on its tip. With his hands, he pulled her hair out from the bristles, and he held the dust and the strands of light hair tight in his palm. That night, the big brother slept in his new room. He could see the neighborhood through his new window, and he saw how the world had looked at his sister from her place of rest. Peaceful. Later that evening, a storm, a winter storm, blew in on the waves of the warm winds that had visited. Outside, the snow fell lightly at first, becoming increasingly heavy beneath the dark cover of night until the flakes grew so thick that the street lamps disappeared from view. In the morning, the old house on the east side of St. Paul was covered in snow, and the family inside huddled close to their fireplace, now alight with flames, keeping each other warm, their little girl's memory like the fire before them, a melt in the freeze of their hearts. So I said that this uh, at the beginning that this book is inspired and it's really written for for a set of siblings. Three years ago, uh, a Hmong girl, a little girl, six years old, drowned on the first hot day of summer. I met that little girl several times at different readings I was doing around the cities. Her mom and her dad were good friends and strong supporters of my work. At one such reading, she had come up to me her eyes glistening and said, when I grow up, I want to be a writer. Not just any writer, I want to be a writer like you. And I thought, how beautiful. When I saw the newspapers, and when I saw that it was she who had drowned, my heart broke. In the days after, I looked for ways, ways I could help, ways in which I could maybe offer something of what I had what I was doing, what I was giving my whole life to, to this family who's going through so very much. And so the book is actually written with permission. It's written for Jenna, her brothers and her sisters. And I'm really, um, I'm very proud of it. It isn't a very happy book. But if only life were that, happiness alone, we didn't have to explore and venture through all the vast emotions that I know we cannot shield our children from. But um, I see that we have plenty of time for our questions. You can choose to write them in the Q&A or the chat feature and Payne can, can facilitate, or we can just have a conversation. There aren't so many of us, so I think it's, it's fairly manageable. At the end of the event, um, you'll hear from Sarah from Subtext Books, one of the fine independent publishing houses I'm sorry, one of the fine independent bookstores in these cities. Um, they've been great champions and supporters of my work. And Sarah's here to, to say a little bit about the bookstore, but also how you can order copies of any of my books. Um, they have signed autograph copies of the shared room available and different methods of delivering and, and all of that. But we have about 20 minutes to talk, so please talk to me. Hi, um, again, hello everyone. My name is Pang from the St. Paul Public Library. Um, I just wanted to say thank you um, for writing this book. I think that um, this is a very difficult topic, but it's also life and it's um, difficult for adults to conceptualize how to have these conversations with themselves and even more so with the child. Um, so thank you as you know we are venturing into having very extremely difficult conversations with with everyone um with our children with our family with our friends with our neighbors um with people who we don't know um and so so i just wanted to say thank you and i i welcome um conversations um i know that you spoke a little bit about it but um you know, where where did you get your inspiration from while well, we we're waiting for people to ask questions? 
in the beginning was that this was a very specific project. I had written a map into the world and, you know, and I, I think that's a lovely book. Um, and I was, I was thinking, you know, I have to write more because in, in St. Paul here, Hmong children dominate the St. Paul public schools and there are so few literarily written books that center Hmong families. You know, places like the east side of St. Paul um, do not make it into the, the children's book world. You know, there were things that I wanted to do. Um, but when this tragedy happened, it kind of stopped everything I wanted to do. I felt my way through it. And on, on, on social media, you know, I was looking at this family and, and witnessing their grief process. You know, at the, the moment in the book where the boy is asked, do you want a room of your own, is an actual moment that happened. You know, Jenna's mother posted one day that she offered her room to her older brother. And my heart was in so many different places, but especially for that little boy who had also met many times. And so I, I wanted to write something for them. You know, in, in, literary, in the literary world, in, particularly in nonfiction writing, we don't ask for permission to write stories. We take them and we make them ours and, and, and that's how it goes. But for me, this book, I could only write it with permission. And so we had an incredibly, for me, an incredibly um, moving conversation. Jenna has mom and dad, her brothers and sisters, and we all sat at a coffee shop. And I, and I offered the manuscript and I said, this is what I've written and I wanna, I'm writing it for you all. Um, how do you feel? And so her mom and her father, I remember they both looked at me and they said, even at her school, they don't know how to talk about it. It is, it is easier to pretend like she hadn't lived, like she hadn't died, than it is to actually discuss the topic of her dying. And so that's part of my hope for the book. I'm hoping that many, many parents and many, many educators will share these, the book with their students. Because grief is such a common human experience. We don't get to escape it. And the more we have, the more compassion we have for others, the more compassion we have for ourselves. So many, many reasons why I could not think of a reason why I shouldn't do it, to be honest. You know, and um, very similar attention. Um, we have a question that just came in. What is one tip you would give to a kid on how to start writing? I say this for everyone. You got to write from where you are. You have to write from where your position. If you speak with an accent, then that accent belongs in your books and your stories. You know, it is what flavors are tone. One cannot change the sensibility of a writer. For example, I'm very short. Most of my metaphors come from the world that's rising toward the sky from the ground. You know, some writers find it in the vast, you know, majestic mountains. But I'm a child of St. Paul, first generation refugee. Uh, my metaphors and my the beauty I find is very much in the life that I that I live. It's a very humble person's life, you know. I'm not looking for the heroes that everybody's writing about. I'm not looking for those stories. I'm looking for the stories that happen across the street. For the families who are living in the falling down houses. My heart is there. So to write from the place where your heart breathes, where your heart lives, and then you can go in and do all the crafty stuff. You can play with structure and you can look for long words and words that sound like poems in and of themselves. But yes, always begin from exactly where you are. And we have a, a comment. Thank you for sharing. Um, I hope that you will continue to write and have more children's books. I would have loved to have something like this growing up, to have a book that could represent me um, as a Hmong person and that I could relate to the topic of death and grief. Thank you. Um, we have another one from Jamie. How did you become a writer? Like a lot of children and refugees and immigrants, I, I grew up thinking, um, believing what my, what my elders taught me, that to survive in America, we needed doctors and lawyers. You know, my mom had six miscarriages after me, so I was the baby for a long time. 
My older sister, sh shortly after we came, she won the North End Elementary School Spelling Bee Contest. So we all decided that she was the one who was good with words. She was the one who would become our lawyer, which then meant by default, I would become a, a doctor. And I like the idea. I like the idea of being to help when people are hurting. You know, in fact, it is not so different from what I do with words as an author. I want to use my words to heal. I don't want you. I don't want to use them to hurt. Um, but yeah, the idea, the reality, and it didn't actually come to me until I was 22. I was about to graduate from Carleton College, and my elderly grandma. She said that she was over 100, but her paperwork said she was 93. Long time ago, she had promised me that she would never die. In Ban Binai refugee camp in Thailand, where I was born, suicide was the number one cause of death. So growing up all around me, I'd hear people saying, why are you dying here in this place? She does not want you. Get up, get up so we can go home. Where was home? All I knew was the, was the hold of that place. So I'd ask all the adults around me. For my grandma, it was a story from the high mountain tops of Laos, a story before the iron eagles took to the skies and balls of fire dropped from their bellies. For my mom and my dad, it was some imagined future across a far ocean where one day their little girl might become an educated person, whatever that was. You know, so when we came to America, I came with all of these stories already inside of me. And growing up poor on St. Paul's East Side, you know, I, I encountered many stories. My mom and dad never had the ability or the desire to protect me from the realities of our lives. I explained our poverty. I knew exactly why I couldn't get the dress I wanted. I knew exactly why, why we with bones and we couldn't have meat because the price of meat at the market was so high. I knew why my mom and dad wore the same jackets year in and year out from the church basements, although they never fit. These were the realities that we were living in. These are the stories that made me who I would become and who I was in the moment. But I was shy and I was scared. I didn't know many writers. I didn't know any Hmong writers growing up, you know? But my senior year of college, my grandma falls and she says to me, I'm not getting up again. And I say to her, you have to, you promised me. And grandma looked at me and she said, you have to understand, there were people who loved me before you. Long ago and far away, I had a mother and a father, brothers and sisters, your grandpa, my most beautiful little girl. She says, there's no Hmong land in the map of a world, but I'm gonna climb this Hmong mountain in my heart. And I knock on the door to the house of my youth. Dinner will be ready and everybody will be there. My grandma never went to school. She didn't know how to read or write. Her biggest fear was that she would be forgotten. And so The Late Homecomer, my very first book, began as a love letter to my grandma to tell her all the reasons why I would never forget her, all of the things that I would always hold close. When that book was published, I became a writer so that it could stand in the world. Because the history that so many of us Hmong people come from is a history that is not that isn't taught. It is a history that so few of our elders have the English ability to speak to the world around them. I was tired of living without understanding on my side. I wanted to be understood. But who we were and what we were doing here, we were not just training from welfare. We were not just farmers along the sides of the roads. There was a history and there would be a future beyond our moment. In writing, I get to do all of that each and every single time. I get to stand up and I say, I am Hmong and I'm so proud of the fact that I'm Hmong. And I come from an incredible array of stories that maybe you've never heard about, but it would be a gift if you'd accept it as such. That's how my journey began. And now how many books after the fact? I'm more insistent and more persistent than ever before that I will live and I would die as a writer in this country and that it will be more than just American literature that I'm contributing to that when the long day is done I will have been I will have presented to the world the whole of the world some of the richness of the stories that I carry inside that we've survived so no looking back it's been a long beginning
Writing is the only thing I persistently and passionately pursued. 22, I'm now 39. Thank you. That was um, so beautiful. And you really captured, like, I feel like the essence of, like, um, being Hmong and our generation as millennials. Um, thank you. Um, so the next question, I just wanted to warn everyone. Um, I just got a notice from Lex saying that I have about five minutes left <laughs> of um, this session. So I'm not sure how or why, but I just wanted to let everyone know that. Um, the next question was, um, what are your favorite books? My favorite books are the most authentic ones. I don't care much about craft. Some There are some very crafty writers in there, among them Vladimir Nabokov, right, which every nonfiction student studies in depth. Um, craft is, craft is, is great, but craft is not what moves me to become a better human being. Craft is not what inspires me to tell one story and then the other. Um, you know, for me, because I'm writing for adults and children, and I'm working on chapter books right now, I read widely. I read all over. Like so many young children in America, in these parts, I grew up reading Laura Ingalls Wilder and Walt Dahl, loved Matilda, you know. And then when I started looking and looking more deeply, the African-American writers, Baldwin, Morrison, Angelou, all of them. And now that I am a, an adult, I try to read, um, never from the best-selling list, because that's not interesting to me. I read books that people recommend for some reason or, or another when somebody says, read this book. Um, that's, those are the books that I read. And I read a lot of student writings because I teach. I teach a lot. Uh, I'm now positioned as the Edelstein Keller Writer in Residence at the University of Minnesota. And I'll be that for the next two years where I'll be expected to teach. Um, I just finished, uh, well, it's been two years now, a, a professorship at Carleton that Benedict, the distinguished visiting faculty there. And so I read a lot of student writing. I see a lot of ideas all the time, new ideas that are working well, new ideas that need some tweaking, and new ideas that don't work at all. So lots of things. Um, because I don't know when we will run, uh, when, how long the time will run. Sarah, if you have anything to say about subtext and how folk can get my books, please. Yes, hello. I'm here from the bookstore. A fun change of background. Um, I just shared a link into the chat with uh, the link to purchase Shared Room as well as all Clea's books. They're all signed. Um, if for some reason the chat is not working for you, sorry, there's a siren going past the bookstore. Um, subtextbooks.com is the website. And there's a, a left-hand column panel. You can just click shop online. All the books are available for, for purchase there. We offer curbside pickup or shipping across the nation. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Pay